And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm going to begin this morning with a quotation. And then we're going to seek the Lord in prayer. This is taken from Testimonies to Ministers. Page 508 and 509. Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Do not rest satisfied in that ordinary course of the season rain will fall. Ask for it. The growth and perfection of the seed rests not with the husbandman. God alone can ripen the harvest. But man's cooperation is required. God's work for us demands the action of our mind the exercise of our faith. We must seek His favors with the whole heart if the showers of grace are to come upon us. We should improve every opportunity of placing ourselves in the channel of blessing. Christ has said, where two or three are gathered together in My name, there am I in the midst. The convocations of the church, as in camp meetings, the assemblings of the home church, and all occasions where there is personal labor for souls are God's appointed opportunities for giving the early and the latter rain. Amen. Did you hear that? It says all the convocations of the church, and then it specifically lists camp meetings. These are considered opportunities that God desires to give the early and the latter rain. But notice what the next paragraph says. It says, But let none think that in attending these gatherings, their duty is done. You've made the first step. You're here, and praise God. But your duty's not done there. It says, A mere attendance upon all the meetings that are held will not in itself bring a blessing to the soul. It's not an immutable law that all who attend these gatherings or local meetings shall receive large supplies from heaven. The circumstances may seem to be favorable for a rich outpouring of the showers of grace, but God Himself must command the rain to fall. Therefore, we should not be remiss in our supplication. We are not to trust the ordinary working of providence. We must pray that God would unseal the fountain of the water of life. We must ourselves receive the living water. Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. At every meeting we attend, our prayers should ascend that at the very time, God will impart warmth and moisture to our souls. Brethren, you have come here in God's providence and in His grace. But the mere attending alone is not going to bring the blessing. We have to pray most earnestly that God would pour out His Spirit. He's the one that causes the rain to fall. And He desires to give it to us more than parents are willing to give good gifts unto their children. So brethren, let's kneel in prayer. And let's ask the Lord for the promise of His blessing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Holy and Heavenly Father, You said in Psalm that I love them that love Me, and those that seek Me early shall find Me. 
Lord, we have come early this morning asking for your promise to be bestowed upon us, not because of our worthiness, no, Lord, but because of your mercy and grace and because you have given us a faith to believe in you. We believe, Lord, help our unbelief. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that you have promised, but we desire that you would unlock heaven and pour him down upon us, Lord, because without him we will never accomplish what you have commissioned us to do. And so, Lord, we pray at this time as we navigate through the word, as we go through the scriptures, as your word says that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. And as we hear this truth, as we learned last night, not only to be just hearers of the word, but help us to be doers as well. Lord, bless us at this time as we move together. And Lord, who am I to even try to explain these deep, this depth of truth, Lord? Please speak through thy men, servant, Lord. And thank you for all your mercies in our life. This morning, bless us. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. And amen. I hope you have a Bible this morning. We're going to be going through it. I'm going to begin in the book of Psalm 99. Psalm 99. And let me hear you say amen when you get there. Psalm 99. Psalm 99. Are there any bakers here this evening? A common principle when baking things is you mix your wet ingredients and then you have your dry ingredients and then you combine them. Is that right? Well, I don't have all the time in the world to bake a cake right now. So I'm going to focus on one area that's important. And so the instructions that I give may be the wet ingredients. Brethren I'd like to come up to you afterwards and say, brother, you know, this is an important point. You didn't preach that. Well, brethren, we only have a limited time to preach what we have to preach. So I understand there's other ingredients involved, but I'm dealing with one specific area of the gospel today. Psalm 99, and you will see it as we go along. Verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between where? He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Bible says that God sitteth between the cherubims. Go to Psalm 80. You're in Psalm 99, just backwards to Psalm 80. And notice what the Bible says there in verse 1. Psalm 80 and verse 1. The Bible says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between what? Between the cherubims, shine forth. The Bible declares in a dozen other texts that he dwelleth between the cherubim. I'm only sharing with you those two today. Go with me to Exodus chapter 25. In the instructions that God was giving to Moses, he instructed the people that they were to build him a sanctuary that he might dwell among them. One of the first things that's listed in the things and the articles that were to be constructed was that of the ark. He instructed them in every detail on how to build this sanctuary and everything that was going into it. But the first attention to the sanctuary and its construction, according to the listing in the Bible, is that of the Ark of the Covenant. Notice what it says in Exodus 25 and verse 8. It says, Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Verse 9 says, According to all that I show thee after the what? After the pattern of the tabernacle. So we understand as deep students of God's word that, the Moses, that Moses constructed this tabernacle on earth as a copy of that which is the original that is in heaven. It was after the pattern. So when we see this on earth, notice what we're looking at. Verse 10, make of thee an ark of shittim wood, and it goes on to give measurements. Skip on down to verse 16. Thou shalt put into the ark what? The testimony which I shall give thee, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. In this ark, the testimony of God was to go. The Bible says in verse 20, actually verse 19, Thou shalt make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other. 
And even the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. The cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look to one another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the what? The testimony that I shall give thee. Moses was commanded to make this ark. And on that ark there was to be two cherubims. And there was a mercy seat that they sat upon. And then in the ark he was supposed to place the testimony. Now I don't presume to think that any of you don't know what that is. I believe we're all here familiar with this truth and what I'm saying. But so that you might be established in the present truth, I want to put arrows in your quiver. Do you have a text to prove to me that this testimony represents the Ten Commandments. If you don't have one, go to Exodus 31. I'll give you one. The testimony, the Bible says in Exodus 31 and verse 18. More specifically, it says here in Exodus 31 and verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount Sinai, two tables of what? Of testimony. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. Do you see that that testimony that was supposed to be placed in the ark was that stone that was written with the finger of God? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10 to establish this point and then we move on. Deuteronomy chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 4, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 4, we just read in Exodus 31, 18 about the word tables. And testimony. What were these tables written with the finger of God? Again, I believe that all of you know this already. But I'm not here to preach at you. I'm here that we can gather together, plan, pray together, and go out to give this message. So you need some scriptures to back up what you believe. Notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 4. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the... Ten Commandments, it says. Do you see how you put line upon line, precept upon precept? You go from one text to the other. Those tables of the testimony that were placed in the ark are the Ten Commandments. As it says there in verse 5, I turned myself, came down from the mount, and put the tables in the ark which I had made. This ark represents the throne of of God. And that throne of God, it says, He dwelleth between the cherubim. God has a kingdom, hence He has a throne. And this throne is founded upon the law of God. That's important to understand because under the law of God, under that mercy seat, the law of God is there. And so God sits upon the throne which is surrounded, it is covered, it is indwelt with. It has all of the connection with the law of God. That's what the throne of God is. Go to Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Yea, just go to Psalms 89. Psalm 89. And amen when you get there. We're building, brethren. We're going somewhere with this foundation. The Bible says in Psalm 89 and verse 14. Do we have that? The Bible says justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall, be, shall go before thy faith. Now notice what it says. Justice and judgment are the habitation. That word habitation, if you look in your margin, means the establishment. Other, other translations say it is the foundation. Justice and judgment. When you think of justice, you think of a courtroom. When you think of a courtroom, you think of a judge. When you think of a judge, the judge upholds the law. So all of it is connected together. The law of God is the very establishment of His throne. Notice what the Bible says in Psalm 97, a few chapters forward. Psalm 97 and verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about Him. You know, we can't understand everything there is to know about God. If we would understand every detail that there was about God, we'd cease to need Him. 
throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, we're ever going to be learning of our Lord and Savior. We're ever going to be learning of the depth of His riches. Don't think that you've come to any great knowledge. You, have, you only know great knowledge when you realize that you're a fool. That's the knowledge that you need to understand, that we don't know nothing before the Lord. Notice what it says here. Even though clouds and darkness, even though God is surrounded with mysteries that are unfathomable, there's one thing that God has revealed, and that's the next part of the text. The next part of the text says, Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of His throne. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of His throne, and that means that God's throne is founded upon righteousness. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, notice what the Bible says in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says this. It says, But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. Do you see that the kingdom of God is built upon righteousness? Over and over, I'm, I'm putting this, this point in a sure place. Is that clear? Everybody say amen. Are you following me thus far? Amen. Beloved, God wants us to understand that the very kingdom in which He rules, which is all the earth, mind you, which is all the universe, mind you, is a kingdom of righteousness. That's why Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His what? And His righteousness. You don't separate the two because they are connected. What is righteousness would be the next question. The Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Righteousness means the law of God. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, if you have a King James Bible, the first four words of that text say, all unrighteousness is sin. We know in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that sin is the transgression of the law. So if unrighteousness equals sin, which is breaking God's law, then righteousness must be the opposite. It means no sin and keeping God's law. Does that make sense? So, beloved, God's foundation of his, of his government is based upon righteousness, the law of God. Now, the psalmist puts a question to us, now that we have a foundation, that I want to examine this question for just a moment. Go to Psalm 11. Psalm 11. A question is asked in this particular psalm. And it should really prick our minds to understand where we are and what we're facing. Psalm 11, do you all have that? Yes. The Bible says in verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Amen. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? You know, that's a solemn question. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? I'm going to put pause right there. I'm going to place all that we have learned right now on the shelf. And we're going to just transition all together. And we're going to pick this back up to blend it at the end of our message. Switching gears now, keep those thoughts in your mind. Let's go to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1. We are told in Desire of Ages, page 83, that it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation upon the life of Christ. We should take it point by point, letting our imagination grasp each scene. And then it says, especially the closing ones. As we dwell on His great sacrifice for us, then it says that our confidence in Him will be more constant. Our love will be 
more quickened, and we shall be endued with more of His Holy Spirit. Especially the closing ones is what the quotation says. Now, in looking at the closing scenes of Christ's life, there are many precious lessons to be learned that are parallels to what God's people are going to go through in these last days. I want you to consider something here. Christ trained His disciples for just over three years now. He was in the shadow of the cross, as it were. He was about to enter into the trial of His life. All of the great controversy was focused here if He would have failed. What shall the righteous do? But He did not fail. He continued on to the cross for our salvation. But the burden that was upon His heart was not alone for Himself. You see, Christ was about to suffer tremendously. I'm talking about physical suffering. Few men have ever experienced the physical suffering that Christ had to experience. But more than the physical suffering, the humiliation that He was about to go through, the pain and anguish, the temptation to realize that those whom He worked for, who He loved, whole towns and villages were healed by His ministry, but who was going to stand up for Him in this hour of His greatest trial? No one. And in those closing minutes, just a thief on the cross. Not even His own disciples. But despite what He was about to go through, His mind wasn't upon Himself. His mind was upon His disciples. And the problem with His disciples is that there was a strife of contention among them. And they had it in their hearts, who's going to be the greatest? They started elbowing, trying to work their way to the closest position to Christ. John was on his one hand because John loved him. But even John and his brother James, they were asking, oh, um, when you bring in your kingdom, can we, can we sit on one hand and then the other hand? Christ says, you don't know what you're asking for. Even they had that mindset. Matter of fact, that stirred up the rest of the disciples. So much so, inspiration says in Acts of the Apostles that it almost brought division amongst the group to the point where they left. They would have left one another. Not because of Christ, but because they couldn't handle each other. That's how much contention was among them. As Christ entered into that upper room, you could see the glances on the disciples' on disciples' faces, looking at one another, going like, their nostrils flaring out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Look at this brother over here. Judas had to rush in there and get close to Christ, didn't he? Sitting right on his right hand. Look how that brother dresses. Look at his tie. This sister doesn't even know the health message. She needs to get it together. This is the attitude that they had one towards another. And Christ had one last lesson that He wanted to give His disciples. And He didn't know how to show them that His true mission was about service. They wanted to be the greatest. Go to Luke 22 so that you can see this. In Luke 22, it says in verse 24, there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? And Christ said to them in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. You know what Christ just said by that statement? He says, those who desire to be the greatest have the mindset of unbelievers, of Gentiles. Those who desire to be the greatest, that spirit is not of the Lord's kingdom. It's not of righteousness and truth. That spirit is of the Gentile world. But notice what he says. He says, but, verse 26, 
ye shall not be so. He that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth what? Serve. As he that doth serve. Amen. Let him be the younger. Do you remember out of all the brothers of Jacob's sons? It was the younger brother, Joseph. Even when Joseph's sons came before Jacob to get the blessing, Jacob placed his hand on the younger. Joseph was like, hold on, he's not the oldest one. He himself forgot the lesson that God put upon him. Let him be as the younger. We think because we're the eldest. We've known truth the longest. I've been in the ministry 50 years, son. That's what the Pharisees said to Christ. Some young 30-year-old trying to preach the truth. But Christ says, let him serve. Christ got down on his hands and knees and grabbed the basin of water and began to wash the filthy feet of those disciples. You know, I don't know if we'll ever understand the humility of Christ. It's going to be something we're going to study throughout all eternity. But I want to fast forward a little bit as time goes on in this message. Another lesson that Christ wanted to teach them is that in order to be successful in the ministry, you need the Holy Spirit. John chapter 13 is when Christ washed the feet of His disciples. Do you know that from that point, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, this is all one episode, as it were. This all transpired within a few hours. This is between the upper room and Gethsemane. And what is the reoccurring theme in John chapter 14, 15, and 16? The Comforter. When He comes, He's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. Another Helper will I send. John 14, if you love Me, then do what? Keep My commandments. But we never read the next verse. And He says, and I will pray the Father, and He shall send you another Comforter. You see, it was the Holy Spirit that the disciples needed because Christ says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. All this time I've been working in your behalf. I've been helping you to learn the kingdom of God. But now you think that because of my absence, you're going to feel the pains of my absence. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's expedient that I go. Because if I go not, then the Holy Spirit cannot come unto you. The Spirit of truth. We need this Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved. We need the Holy Spirit. Notice, I want to read to you a quotation here. Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. This is page 48. 47, forgive me. When Christ gave His disciples the promise of the Spirit, He was nearing the close of His earthly ministry. Remember, Desire of Ages 83 says, especially the closing scenes of His life. He was near the close of His ministry. He was standing in the shadow of the cross with the full realization of the load of guilt that was to rest upon him as the sin bearer, before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, he instructed his disciples regarding a most essential and complete gift which was to bestow upon his followers, the gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of his grace. It says the evil, I'm skipping down, the evil that had been accumulating for centuries was to be resisted by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. The evil that had been accumulating for centuries. The evil that had been accumulating for centuries. Do you know how much evil that is? For centuries, beloved, are we living in a time where there is an accumulated evil in the land? I mean, the brother just gave the report about 
God seeking to warn people before the calamities come, and calamities will increase and increase. Inspiration says they will increase until the earth will no more cover its slain. Like the pangs of the birth that the women that women go through. I mean, this world is getting worse and worse. Because the evil is accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. Do you think you have the power to convict anybody? We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Before that Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 1, that's where I had asked you to go. Are you there? What were the disciples doing? The Bible says the disciples, in verse 14, these all continue with one accord and prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all looking at each other with criticism and malice, judging one another. Is that what it says? No. It says they were all together on one accord. Do you guys know what to be together all on one accord means? Go to Philippians chapter 2. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, If there be, any, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. I'm in verse 2 of Philippians 2. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of what? One accord of one mind. Then it goes on to clarify even more detail. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. What did the disciples have in that upper room before the foot washing? They had strife. That's what Luke 22 said. It says, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Beloved, do you understand that by studying the closing scenes of Christ's life, we are learning what we need to learn as we are entering the closing scenes of this earth's history? If you don't believe that, just look at the circumstances. You had the church, the Jews coming together with the state, the Romans, and the result was that Christ was persecuted. When church and state combined it, Christ was crucified. And as one of the last lessons that he wanted to show his disciples was, you have to learn humility in order to serve, and in order to serve effectually, you need the Spirit of God. That was the last lesson that he wanted to give to his disciples, and the last blessing of the greatest magnitude that God wants to pour upon His church is the power of the latter rain. But until God's people learn to love one another, learn to esteem others better than themselves, notice what it says in verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Brethren, we are so selfish by nature. We don't want to encourage one another. We criticize. Like cannibals, we feast upon the characters of others. The Bible says by beholding, we become changed. I remember it growing up, and I got to the age where I wanted to drive, and I got my license, and I got interested in mechanics, and that's what I do by trade. That's my, that's my tent making, as it were. I'm, a, I'm an auto mechanic. And, you know, I've had many cars in my life. Not always new cars, mostly used cars that I'd have to fix up. But I noticed something every time I got another vehicle that I started driving. That all of a sudden, when I went to the parking lot, when I was at the red light, I started seeing that vehicle more often. You think you're the only one driving, and then when you get that vehicle, all of a sudden, you see a lot more of them. Why? Because your eyes are tuned in. Do you know that sometimes we see the faults of others so clearly because we're driving the same vehicle? That's right. 
You spot it, you got it. We, so, we, we can discern it so quickly. Why? <laughs> because we're dealing with it. Brethren, unity is what Christ desired of His disciples as He was approaching the final scenes of His life. And do you think that God wants unity as we approach the final scenes of the earth's history? Now, brethren, I know there's many dynamics involved. You know, I know we're so scattered on doctrines and truths and so on and so forth, but there was one thing that prevailed with the disciples. I'm going to read to you another quotation. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 39. Not page 39. Forgive me, brethren. I want to find this quotation. It's all right that a preacher has notes. He doesn't have everything in his head. Let me find my notes. Acts of the Apostles, page 48. This is what it says. I'm just going to read one section of this, um, this paragraph in page 48. It says, One interest prevailed. One subject of emulation swallowed up all others. The ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of His kingdom. You know, brethren, we're going to have differences, no doubt. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the disciples still had a few differences. You remember Paul and Peter? Peter had to be confronted by Paul. That was after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't mean that we're all necessarily going to agree on all the methods of evangelism and workings that we do. But that does not mean that you have to become critical. It does not mean that you have to step out of the box and become judgmental. It does not mean that you have to be condemnatory of others when they're seeking to do the work of the Lord according to the capacity that God has given them. Brethren, we need to learn to encourage one another. The disciples had to be on one accord, and that one accord was that they saw in each other that they were sons and daughters of God, and they encouraged one another instead of becoming critical. Now the devil is still alive, and he's going to create strife among us. But brethren, there's one lesson that we need to learn. Do you know that in order for a rainbow to shine, it doesn't take just one drop of water. The beauty of the rainbow is displayed when all the thousands and million droplets of water are being shined through. The same one sun shines through all those droplets of water. If we want to present this beautiful picture to the world, each one of us as a droplet of water has to allow that sunshine to, fl to flow through us. Don't think that you're by yourself and going to make a rainbow to the world. You're not. All of us together working. Do you think that these large rivers like the Nile, or where I'm from in Oregon and Washington areas, the Columbia River, a huge river, miles in width. But how did that river get to be that size? All the little streams and, and trills that fill up flowing down from the mountains as it gathers together. So all the attention goes to the river but the river only was blessed because of all the little streams that flow to it. Brethren, there's some of us that are in ministry that are more public. But the ministry has not succeeded or successful unless there are individuals working behind the scenes. This camp meeting is not a blessing without people cleaning up the rooms and preparing the, the, the kitchen and the food. There's people laboring hard, waking up. My father-in-law back there was up before 5 o'clock in the morning so that you could have hot water this morning. I mean, little things put together, but all of us working together. All of us working together to get the job done. Brethren, if I told you, go out there and cut the whole field, you might think, oh, I need to do this, but then I give you a pair of scissors and say, cut the whole field. You're going to be like, what? I can never accomplish this. But you know, if there's 144,000 of us, we might get something done. Each one of us have our little scissors. But if we pray together, the Lord can give us a John Deere. Amen? Amen. <laughs> he can give that power of the Holy Spirit and the, and, and the grass will get cut. The work will get done. 
But we have to work together. And don't complain about my little pound. Oh, this is cheap scissors. Don't think that you're going to do a great work for God until you're willing to be faithful with the little work. The disciples had to do this. Learning to work together. Now as we wind down, I want to show you something powerful. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. No, forgive me. Forgive me. Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8. Amen. Amen. Do any of you have titles in your Bible? Yes. What's the title say? The consecration of the priest. The consecration of the priest. Verse number one, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. Gather thou a few members of the congregation. No, it says gather all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Amen. You see, this ceremony that was performed here was when the priest was anointed as the high priest, this ceremony here. And at the anointing of the priest, all the congregation had to be together. This wasn't just a select few. The anointing of the high priest... All the congregation had to be together. Go down to verse 12. He poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head. What did he do? He poured that anointing oil on Aaron's head to sanctify him. Fast forward as well, verse 30. Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar, and he sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon his sons' garments with him. And he sanctified Aaron, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garment with him. Go to chapter 9. At the end of this ceremony, something happened. Notice verse 22. And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them. Aaron now, he had just been anointed, consecrated to his office of high priest. All the congregation was together. It says Aaron lifted his hand together toward the people. He blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people, and there came fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar, the burnt offering, and the fat. And when the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Amen. Patriarchs and prophets says that when they saw this, it was as a token of God's glory and of His favor. This was the day that the priest was anointed. All the congregation was together. Moses and Aaron lifted up their hands to bless the people, and then fire came down from out of heaven. Beloved, go to now Acts chapter 2. No, scrap Acts chapter 2, go to Psalms 133. Psalms 133, you already know what happened in Acts chapter 2. Psalms 133, I want to tell you something, brethren. Christ had promised His disciples. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And in that promise, throughout those chapters of John, from 14 to 16, over and over again, He gave them the promise of the Holy Spirit. He told them in Luke chapter 24, Tarry ye here in the city of Jerusalem, till you be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 2, that power of the Holy Spirit was poured upon them. Notice what it says in Psalm 133. Do you have that? The Bible says in Psalm 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. How? In unity, the Bible says. But notice what it then begins to read. It says, It is like, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, 
upon Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. When did Aaron receive that anointing? What happened? All the congregation was gathered together. And it says that fire came down out of heaven on that day. And all the people shouted for joy because they saw that it was a token of God's glory and of His favor. The same thing is happening here. Why do we know the same thing is happening here? The Bible says, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You see, beloved, Christ is known as the prophet the priest and the king. When he, were, when he walked on this earth, he was the prophet. But when he went to heaven, what did he become? He became the priest. And just like Aaron, who was anointed with the oil, Christ, when he went up to heaven, had to be inaugurated into his position as the high priest of heaven. And it says that when the brethren dwelt together in unity, it's like the priest was being anointed. Notice what Acts of the Apostles says in page 39. The Bible says this, Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this, they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, He was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified even with the glory which He had with the Father from eternity. Now notice what it says here. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to His promise, He has sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to His followers as a token that He had as the priest and king received all authority in heaven and on earth and was the anointed one over all His people. When they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that was a token that Christ indeed was the Messiah, that it was no deception. I've seen him rise up into the heaven and he's now at the right hand of the Father. He is in the temple of God and he has all power that he wants to give to us. That's why they're able to speak with boldness. That's why they went out preaching. That's why 3,000 were converted in a day because they realized they had one who had all power on their side. Beloved, when they were together in unity, that's when the oil was poured. Don't you know that whatever the husband receives, so does the wife? Brethren, when Christ received the anointing in heaven for His priestly office, the anointing was given to the disciples on earth for their work and for their ministry. But it said that they had to be in unity together. It was as the dew upon the mountains is what Psalm 133 said. We learned a little bit about that yesterday. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, it says that my doctrine shall drop as the rain and shall distill as the dew, beloved. You know that old song that says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, beloved. Do you know that that dew was the power of the Holy Spirit? Guess what time the manna fell in the morning? It says that while the dew and the frost was on the ground, if you did not get the manna, you did not get the dew that came with it, beloved. The dew and the manna went hand in hand. The Bible says the words that I speak unto you are spirit and they are life. The Word of God is how we receive that Spirit of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and in verse 12, it says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. What is that power? What is the sons of God? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, that they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
Beloved, we need the Holy Spirit, so why don't we pray about it? Why don't we preach upon it? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we long for it, beloved? This is what we need so that we can have the power with great power to give witness for the Lord in these last days. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. Our work would be like cutting the grass out there in the field with a pair of scissors. Beloved, do you know that if you have a hardened heart, the Lord can soften it with the dew? <laughs> do you know that in, 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 in Daniel chapter 5 and in Daniel chapter 4, there was a man named King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was out in the field. The Bible says that his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of God. It was the dew of heaven that had to be upon his body every day for seven years before he realized it, beloved. You might be as hard as King Nebuchadnezzar, but God can soften your heart with the dew of heaven. <laughs> beloved, we need this experience. In closing, I want to share with you one last principle. Go back to Psalm 11. Let's pick up on the shelf from where we had left off. The disciples were confirmed in their belief that the Lord indeed was at the right hand of God. This thought was no longer a matter with faith to them. It was fully established in their minds. Fully established. It wasn't a he might be up there interceding for me. They knew very well that he was. The Bible says in Psalm 11 and verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, Beloved, are the foundations being destroyed in Adventism today? Have mercy they are. They are. But it says, what shall the righteous do? And look at the next text. Verse 4 says, don't forget. I'm adding those words. Forgive me if you're offended by that. It says, don't forget. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The implication is, even though it looks like the foundations will be destroyed, they won't be destroyed. You can't destroy God's foundations. The truth will conquer. The truth will go on. But what is our consolation if we see the, the foundations being destroyed? We have to look and say, the Lord is in His holy temple. Notice this text right up here on the, on the board here. It says, but the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. You know who said that? Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk was the prophet who was a contemporary with Jeremiah. It was when the Chaldeans, Babylon, was overtaking the land. He said the Lord is in His holy temple. When Jonah was in the belly of the whale. When he was in the greatest trial of his life, what was his consolation? You read Jonah chapter 2 and verse 4. It says that my, my prayer went up to the temple of the Lord. Beloved, we have a precious truth as seven-day Adventists. We believe that Christ is in the temple of the Lord. He is standing at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary where all power is given from God to His praying people in the time of the latter rain. Beloved, we must realize that it's in the temple of God from which we draw strength. We have to look to that. But, brethren, we need to have unity. All the disciples were all together on one accord, in one place, it says. In one place. Now, brethren, God's people are all throughout the world. So how can we be all together in one place? That's right. In spirit... And by faith, all of us are gathered together in the most holy place. When our minds are there, we are all together in one place and on one accord. This is the lessons that God wants us to learn for our Kent meetings. That we need the latter rain 
And God can only give it to us when, like the disciples, we learn to love one another and we learn to pray for it so that we can accomplish the work that He has called us all to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray for this experience. Holy and Heavenly Father, help us learn, O oh Lord, the importance of that thoughtful hour each day upon the contemplation of Christ's life. Lord, as we study the Scriptures, help us to long for the character of Christ. Help us to realize that without this experience, Lord, we won't be able to stand in the position that You would have us. But Lord, by the power of God, we believe that You intercede at the right hand of the Father, and that you are willing to give us your Holy Spirit more than parents are willing to give good gifts to their children. Amen. Lord, you are more willing because you desire to see Oklahoma City saved. You desire to see Dallas saved, as many as will believe. You desire to see New York and Chicago and all the cities all over the world, Lord. All the towns and all the countries and every person, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, Lord, you desire for the salvation as many as would hear the gospel. Amen. But Lord, you are looking for us to be your hands and feet as it were. You're looking for us to cooperate with you. And Lord, how can we do it without your Holy Spirit? Too often, Lord, we are critical of one another. Help us put these things away, Lord. Help us to look to Christ as our example and learn to serve one another. Help us to esteem others better than ourselves. Help us to have the humility of heart as did Christ and as He taught His disciples so that we can be recipients of the latter rain and finish up, Lord, so we can go home. Thank You for our time this morning and may we med upon, meditate upon these truths throughout the day. In Jesus' name we thank You and we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.